Hi, everyone. So we're going to begin unit three. Unit three focuses on heat. So similar to unit two, we're going to sort of start with the qualitative, the descriptive. Then we're going to move into the quantitative, the math. Uh, so some of the qualitative topics we're going to talk about um, are really the difference between heat and temperature. Uh, we're going to talk about the three types of heat transfer, which you might remember uh, if you've taken physical science. Uh, we're going to talk about the six phase changes. Um, we're going to talk about phase diagrams. Uh, and that's kind of my goal for this video. I'm looking to aim for about 45 minutes or so. We'll see how far I make it. Uh, and then later on in unit three, we're going to cover um, some uh, like phase, uh, not phase diagrams, uh, heating curves, heating curves, cooling curves. We got a couple of labs we're going to do in unit three. And then we're going to switch to math and talk about Q equals MC delta T and some other related formulas. So let's get right to it. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is heat versus temperature. Let's talk about temperature first. And you should know this from unit two. You know, what is temperature? Well, a good like elementary school definition would be how hot something is or how cold something is. Well, we know more about temperature now after we finish unit two. Temperature is a measure of how fast the particles are moving. It's about their movement. And we can even go into a little more detail here. When it comes to temperature, We can call this the average kinetic energy of the particles. Kinetic energy, or Ke, oh, Ke, not K, of the particles. And what is kinetic energy? It's just the energy associated with movement. So you could think of temperature as a measure of how fast the particles are moving, which you should have known already from unit two. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is this word average. Picture any kind of sample of a solid, liquid, or a gas. It's probably easiest to visualize this in a gas. In a gas, the particles are moving very fast on average. But since they're always bumping into each other and bumping into the walls, it just so happens that some of them might be slowed way down. I mean, picture, you know, a certain collision, like maybe a, a three-part collision where two of them come in this way, one of them comes in that way, and two of them bounce off, and the one that remains behind, it ends up like canceling out all of its momentum, and it's basically standing still. I mean, in a gas sample, are there gas particles that are nearly standing still, nearly perfectly not moving? Yeah, but on average, the speed is faster. In a liquid, same thing. On average, the particles are moving around very quickly, but are there some that happen to be moving slowly? Yeah, and you know they'll get bumped by a neighbor and start moving fast. So if you're comparing like a cold liquid to a hot liquid, are there some particles in the cold liquid moving faster than some particles in the hot liquid? Of course, but on average, the speed is different. So that's why we focus on the average kinetic energy of the particles. For heat, it's more like the total amount of particle movement. Now, as a disclaimer, this is not like the official definition of heat. Uh, you can just think of it like this. It's a good way for comparing it to temperature. And the key here is total. It's about like the total amount of particle movement uh, in a sample of matter. So heat is really hard to define. We usually off only kind of define it in terms of when it's being transferred. Um, but again, the, the main thing I want to emphasize here is like the average versus the total. And to give an example here, I like to talk about an icy pond, okay, icy pond, let's literally picture there's like ice chunks floating in it. Icy pond and a cup of coffee. Okay. Cup of coffee 
in an icy cold pond. So which one of these has a higher temperature? Well, it's obvious. The icy pond has a lower temperature and the cup of coffee has a higher temperature. Because temperature is the speed of the particles. Uh, so on average, I should say the average speed of the particles, on average, the icy pond's particles are moving slower than the hot cup of coffee's particles. But let's talk about heat. Which one of these would you say has more total movement of particles? Well, are the icy ponds water molecules moving, even if they're like on the verge of freezing? Well, yeah, even if they're frozen, even if it's an iceberg, the iceberg has way more movement in total than the cup of coffee. Because even though the particles aren't freely flying around or zipping around or shifting around, they're still vibrating. Even if they're cold solids, they're still shaking. There's still movement there. So in terms of the total movement, the icy pond is going to have a lot more total movement. So for this, I'm going to say more heat. And for the cup of coffee, less heat. Now, am I saying the cup of coffee is less hot because it has less heat? No. When we say hot and cold in everyday language, we're talking about temperature. We're not talking about heat. The cup of coffee feels hotter because it has a higher temperature. That's what we associate with heat. But overall, well, that's what we associate when we say it, it feels hotter. Overall, there is less total heat in the cup of coffee. Uh, similar with the icy pond, it feels colder because the particles move slower, but there is more total heat. Maybe think of it like this. Imagine two different groups of people, a stadium full of football fans or a high school track meet. Let's think of that in terms of heat versus temperature. Heat, or no, let's start with temperature. Temperature is like the total movement. Oh, sorry, the average movement, I said it wrong. Temperature is like the average movement. So if you picture a high school track team or like a cross country team, probably a better example, because in track, a lot of people are like throwing things, they're not really running. A, a high school cross country team, they're all running pretty quickly. On average, their speed is faster. But if you look at the total amount of movement in a 70,000 person football stadium, 70,000 people, you know, people are getting up, people are walking to their seats, people are standing up and cheering. There's more total movement there. So this is the difference between heat and temperature. Understand average versus total, understand the kinetic energies associated with the speed of the particles. Um, and really this should be a bit of a re review in terms of uh, temperature. The next thing I wanna talk about uh, are the three types of heat transfer. So heat, if, which is just a form of energy, and I'll sometimes use those terms interchangeably, heat and energy, uh, it's always going to be conserved. It just gets transferred from one medium to another. And when it comes to heat transfer, transfer, we have uh, three methods. The first one is conduction. The other two, convection and radiation. Conduction is heat transfer through the direct contact between particles. When I slap the table, there's direct contact between my hand and the table and heat transfers. And heat always transfers from hot to cold. That's why we say heat transfers. We don't say cold transfers. You know, when your parents say in the middle of the summer, uh, close the door, you're letting the cold out. Well. In a way, you kind of are, but it's more like you're letting the heat in. Although in that case, the cold air will leave generally through the bottom of your open doorway and the hot air from outside will come in generally through the top part of your open doorway. Uh, but either way, when it comes to heat transfer, we want to talk about heat moving from hot items to cold items. So in terms of a definition here, uh, we can say heat transfer Uh, through direct contact of particles. I'll just say through direct contact. On a large scale, we're talking about surfaces touching. On a small atomic scale, we're talking about particles touching. So classic example of conduction, let me move this up if I can. 
When I think conduction, I picture a hot plate, which is a little usually machine like this with a couple knobs on it, so it controls temperature. And you put your beaker of water on top. And you turn it on and the hot plate turns hot. Basically there's a coil with an electric wire running through it and it gives off a lot of resistance and a lot of heat and that heats up this surface. So the surface between them where it touches, there is your conduction. Or I should say that's the best example of the conduction here. I mean, there's conduction when air particles smack against the walls of the beaker. There's conduction when the water molecules inside hit the inside walls of the, of the beaker. Anytime anything touches anything else, heat is always gonna be transferred from hot to cold, and that is conduction. So when I talk about the bottom of the beaker touching the top of the hot plate, that's kind of the best example of conduction. The next type of, of uh, heat transfer is convection. Now, instead of defining it first, let's go with the picture here. And in fact, let's picture that same beaker from the last slide with water in it. Well, I'll do a water level like this. And we have some kind of a heat source down here. You know, whether it's an open flame, whether it's sitting on a hot plate, you're heating up uh, you know, some kind of uh, beaker of water there. What's going to happen? Well, the water is going to warm up. Why is the water going to warm up? Well, because there's conduction of hot particles at the bottom, whether it's on a hot plate or whether it's touching the uh, hot gases within the flame. But it's going to heat up the hottest on the bottom. Now, what does hot water do? It expands. You may have thought rises. We say heat rises. Well, we say heat rises, but that's because hot liquids and gases expand. There's that thermal expansion we talk about. And when something expands, what does its density do? If something has the same mass, but you, you spread that mass over a larger volume, the density drops. And something with now a lower density is going to rise up relative to something with the regular density, you know, the, the density was before. So that's why we say hot air rises, because the air around it is now more dense. That's why we say hot water rises. So what's happening is the water at the bottom is going to heat up and rise, kind of like this. So what remains in its place? Uh, a vacuum? Do you, do you create a void of air? No, of course not. Water from the rest of the beaker is going to fill that spot. In. And really, if we think about it, now that this hot water has made it to the surface, it's no longer right next to the heat source, so it's not gonna heat up as fast. And now the new water at the bottom is gonna heat up in its stead. And really, what's gonna happen with this hot water at the top? Since it's not connected directly to the heat source anymore, it's not conducting heat directly from it, it's gonna, well, I was gonna say it's gonna cool down. It's not gonna cool down, but it's gonna warm up less than the stuff below it. So in a sense, you could think of it as now colder. And now that it's colder, it's going to drop back down. And we create this cycle here where the water at the bottom warms up and rises and re is replaced by colder water at the top. And then that colder water that's now at the bottom heats up. And once it becomes hotter than the stuff above it, it's going to now rise up. And the water above that now comes to the bottom and gets heated up more and rises. And then that's it. And it creates this never ending cycle. And we refer to this as a convection current or a convection cycle. This happens in a beaker water. And in fact, you may have even noticed this. Like if you have um, you know, a couple little pieces of like pasta or something left over in boiling water, uh, you can literally see the pasta like fly to the top, sink back down, fly to the top, sink back down. It's like riding on a, you know, a wave of this convection. So we see it in a small scale. Uh, in beakers. We see this on the largest scale we know of here on planet Earth, which is planet Earth. Inside Earth, we have four layers. There's the inner core, the outer core, the mantle, and the crust. Forgive me, this is not to scale. The crust I actually drew way too big. The crust is very thin. It's like thinner than the skin on an apple would be relative to Earth. But this is the mantle. And in the mantle, 
the mantle is kind of like a liquidy solidy. I, I've heard it described as like fresh poured asphalt. Like picture, you know, a truck, a crew uh, making laying down a new road. That asphalt like slowly pours out of the truck, and then they roll it out with a steamroller. Uh, that's like the material of the mantle. And well, when it's near the bottom, it's near the center of the earth, the hottest part of the earth, and it's going to rise up. And once it goes to the top, does it cool down? Well. Maybe it doesn't, well, actually in this case, yeah, it would cool down because it's uh, away from the initial heat source. But more importantly, the stuff below it is gonna warm up more and kind of replace it. So you can think of it as the cooler mantle kind of dropping down. So just like we saw in the beaker, the mantle undergoes convection as well. And this mantle is thousands of miles deep. It, it's like a massive wide scale uh, convection current here. And what ends up happening is at the surface, this, top part of the crust, which we know of as a plate, plate tectonics, it essentially rides that convection current like a surfboard, and that's what drives plate tectonics. It's one of the factors, probably the, the biggest factor though. So why do the plates move? A big reason is because they're riding the mantle as it undergoes that convection like that. So we see convection in a small scale, we see it in a, a larger scale. We see it in anything that's allowed to flow. The word fluid just means either a liquid or a solid. Uh, so, nope, cut that. Uh, fluid is either a liquid or a gas, anything that can flow. So we see convection in fluids. Um, I don't have a gas example here, but I mean, if you imagine, uh, let's say we have like a Bunsen burner flame. Uh, so here's your blue cone and the outer blue cone. Uh, what's the hottest part? Well, let me do it this way. Would I want to hold my hand right next to this three inches away or right above this three inches above? Well, I wouldn't want to do either. I should have phrased it as what would be the more idiotic, insane idea. And it would be to put your hand right above it. In fact, I'd say probably two feet above a Bunsen burner flame is hotter than two inches away from it on the side. And you know this because you work with Bunsen burner flames and you'll continue to work with them. You can hold your hand next to a Bunsen burner flame while you're like holding a set of crucible tongs for a long time. But if you put your hand above that, and I don't mean in the flame, I mean feet above it, you're gonna burn your skin. You're gonna burn whatever you're holding. And that's because we see convection in the air above the flame. The air immediately around this heats up, thermally expands, rises up, and is replaced by cooler air above it. So we get this convection cell. That's why above the flame is going to be way hot. So let's give this a definition. Again, tough to define. I usually say something like heat transfer through fluids. Uh, due to differences in density. Heat transfer through fluids due to differences in density. So think of other real life examples you can come up with for convection occurring. There's plenty. The last type of heat transfer is radiation. Let's just define this one. Radiation is heat transfer uh, through space in the form of weight. Heat transfer through space in the form of waves. Now, when I say space, I don't necessarily mean outer space. I mean just like space, like uh, a place, like from one place to another, like from me to my laptop, space. So we can think of it on a small scale. We can also think about on a large scale. And in fact, I usually go with the large scale as my first example. Radiation is one of the many reasons why we're all here, because without the sun's radiation, you know, life would not begin, there would not be energy, 
for any of the processes we need. So if that's the sun and that's the earth, some continents there. Radiation travels in waves. It gets us our energy. Again, that's large scale. Smaller scale is if I have anything hot, it just gives off heat. I mean, you've probably heard of a radiator. You know, a radiator is just something in your house or in your school or a building that gives off heat. Well, when I say it gives it off in the form of waves, really that's that, you know, that uh, the form of energy transfer there is this wave motion. We don't see this, of course. Um, and really one of the main things I wanna get at with this is you don't need a medium through which to transfer it. What that really means is you don't need any kind of particles to physically carry that energy. With conduction, you need particles. I mean, it's literally, the definition is it's transferring energy from particle to particle as they touch. And even with convection, you still need particles to expand or contract with heat to rise. Convection does not need any kind of particles to transfer. It can go through space, literally outer space, which is a vacuum. And we're fortunate for this, otherwise we wouldn't get any heat here on Earth. What are some uh, examples of radiation? I mean, you've heard of just radiation as this like terrible, dangerous thing. Usually we refer to radiation as um, like uh, gamma radiation, which is like nuclear fallout, that type of radiation. Like anytime a nuclear bomb goes off or uh, you know, if there's a nuclear power plant accident, yeah, that is radiation. But radiation is also just energy from the sun. There's UV radiation, ultraviolet. There's IR radiation, infrared. There's visible light. And in fact, ultraviolet and infrared, the violet and red, uh, they correlate with the color spectrum, like Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, uh, indigo, violet. Uh, anything on the higher energy side of violet, we call ultraviolet, and the lower energy side of red, we call infrared. So there's plenty of types of, inf of radiation, and I just want us to really understand what it is. So those are the three types of heat transfer. And uh, I like to sort of describe this in like a campfire metaphor. Uh, so if you're looking at a campfire, let me get some brown here. Okay, so there's your wood, and let's get some fire going. Okay, so if you have a campfire going, and I would ask you uh, where we see convection, or where you would feel convection the most. Let me lower this down. Think about what you would say for that. Where you would feel convection? Well, the best place you would feel convection would be in the hot air rising up above it here. So here's your convection. Where would you feel radiation? Well, you would feel it everywhere in all 360 degrees around it, every three dimension. Radiation just naturally travels out in waves in every direction. If you're above it, are you feeling radiation? Yes, but you're mostly feeling convection. Like there is radiation traveling straight up, but you're mostly feeling the convection. What about conduction? How would you be able to be at this campfire and experience conduction? Well, it would be pretty reckless and stupid, but if you reach your hand in and grab that wood, that would be conduction right here. If you could somehow touch this conduction. All right. So those are the three, uh, three types of heat transfer that we should know. Uh, let's talk now about phase changes. There are six phase changes that we're going to talk about. Um, and they correlate, of course, with the three phases, which are solid, liquid, and gas. Now, why do I write it like this? I'm kind of ranking it in terms of energy. Gases have the highest energy, liquids have the middle, and solids have the lowest energy. Six phase changes. They're solid until actually, I'm not going to go with red on this for a reason. Solid to liquid, liquid to solid, liquid to gas, gas to liquid. That's four. How do we get six out of this? Well, there is also a phase change of solids skipping all the way to gas and a phase change of gas skipping all the way to solid. There's your six. 
Now, some of these have very common names that you use in your everyday life. Some of them you may not have ever heard of at all. Solid to liquid, melting. Um, I don't have too much room here. If, you, if on your page you have room, you can write it in right with the arrow. But I'm going to do it this way. Solid to liquid is melting. Melting. But there is another word. Melting. But there is another word I want you to know uh, for this. Sometimes we call it fusion. Melting or fusion. Now, fusion in science has a couple different meanings. There's actually, there, there's nuclear fusion when two small atoms are traveling so fast that they come together, but they don't bounce off each other. Their nuclei actually manage to touch, which can only happen if they're going absurdly fast. And once the nuclei touch, the atoms fuse together. Where in our solar system do you think it gets hot enough for this to happen? The sun. The sun is basically a fusion factory where hydrogen atoms speed up so fast that every now and then they get lucky enough to hit at the right angle with the right speed, they fuse together. And when hydrogen, number one, combines with hydrogen, number one, what do you get? Helium, number two. Our sun is basically like a helium factory. And when that helium gets produced, it gives off an incredible amount of energy. And that's what we're experiencing. We're basically feeling the uh, residual heat from the fusion reaction. Long tangent to just tell you that that's not the same as this. So melting, AKA fusion is solid to liquid. Now listen, I don't use the term fusion in my everyday life, but we will do a lab called heat of fusion lab. And that's the fusion we're talking about. Okay, let's do the opposite. Liquid down to solid. What do we call this? Uh, liquid down to, oh, freezing. I almost thought I said that one, first one wrong. Uh, yeah, freezing. And no fancy other term for this one, we just call it freezing. Uh, let's talk about liquid heating up to a gas. Uh, liquid to gas. Now, what do you think this is called? Well, you probably said boiling or evaporation. Those are the two common words we use. There is a difference here. Those both fall under the category we call vaporization. Vaporization is like the official title for liquid to gas. Now, vaporization can be in one of two ways. It can be either boiling or evaporation. What's the difference? Well, we've talked about evaporation a lot. I refer to it as dumb luck. When a particle near the surface in a liquid just happens to get booted by its neighbor with just the right speed and direction to fly off. The difference between boiling and evaporation is the temperature at which it happens. If it happens below the boiling point, we refer to it as evaporation. So we'll say below BP boiling point. When does boiling occur? At the boiling point. Well, what, if, what happens if a liquid ends up above its boiling point? Well, that actually can't happen unless you do certain things to it, like add certain particles to it. Like if you add salt to water, it can uh, raise its, uh, elevate its boiling point. So besides little tricks you do, liquids can't get hotter than their boiling point because once they hit that boiling point, the temperature stops rising and it boils away. Okay, so that's vaporization, which can either be boiling or evaporation. That leaves three other phase changes. What's the opposite of vaporization when we have a gas and we cool it down and it turns to a liquid? Condensation. Condensation. You've heard this term before. We talked about it a lot after the mass and change lab. Uh, you know, this is what happens in clouds. Water vapor cools down and condenses into liquid water, which then falls as rain. This leaves the two long ones, the solid all the way up to gas, the gas all the way down to solid. You may have heard of solid to gas. Solid to gas is sublimation. solid skips directly to a gas. Uh, now, not every substance does this under normal conditions. There is a famous one that does though. wonder if you know what it is. Well, it's CO2. CO2 undergoes sublimation. It skips the liquid phase. What do we call solid CO2? Dry ice. Why do we call it dry ice? Because it never melts. 
why don't you open a pause this open a new tab and just google dry ice and look at some of the images what you'll see are an ice what looks like an ice cube steaming why does it do this well we'll talk about that when we get to phase diagrams but essentially it skips the liquid phase and goes right to a gas what's the opposite of this gas down to solid we call this deposition so anything that undergoes sublimation will also undergo deposition. If you take a tank of CO2 gas and cool it down, you will look at that gas cooling, look at that cooling, of course you can't see anything, but all of a sudden you'll start to see little crystals appear at the bottom and that's solid CO2 forming from that gas. You're gonna skip the liquid. You're not gonna see condensation. You're just gonna get right to solid. We call that deposition. Okay, so it's six main vocab terms where we have condensation, sublimation, deposition, melting, AKA fusion, freezing, and vaporization. And you should also know the difference between boiling and evaporation. And in fact, I think I talked about this at the start of the year, but I also want you to be careful with your words. When we refer to a gas, if the, well, sort of a gas, I guess. Um, when, when a substance is in its gaseous form below the boiling point, we refer to it as a vapor. Like right now in the room, there is water vapor around you. It's not technically called gaseous water or water gas. You know, you could say it's water in its gaseous form. That's okay. But technically we call it water vapor because it is simply evaporated. It didn't boil to get there. Uh, compare that to anything above its boiling point, that's a gas. So right now you have nitrogen gas and oxygen gas around. You. We are well above the boiling points of those. So we refer to them as gases. Uh, okay, uh, the next thing I want to talk about are with these phase changes, there are two other terms that I want you to know. Endothermic and exothermic. These are adjectives to describe changes. And in this case, we're going to talk about phase change in the context of endothermic and exothermic. Well, thermic obviously means heat. Endo versus exo. Think about some of the words you might know that have that start with endo. Uh, like maybe you've heard of endosymbiosis from biology. That's the idea of one tiny little single cell organism that ended up going inside a larger single cell organism. And instead of just dying, it ends up surviving, thriving, and forming a helpful relationship where the smaller one provided energy and the larger one provided protection. That's endosymbiosis, which is one of the leading theories of why we have multicell organisms. Endo means in, uh, or like an endoscopy or an endocardiologist is gonna be a doctor focusing on like inside the human body. So think of this as in heat, or in other words, uh, absorbs heat. Exo, what is an exodus? It's a mass leaving of people. Uh, think of like exit, you leave uh, off of something. Or an exoskeleton, insects have an exoskeleton on the outside. So this is like out, and this is uh, releases heat. Each of those six phase changes I mentioned, sublimation, deposition, freezing, melting, vaporization, condensation, they fall into one of these two categories. Now you could just straight up memorize, but I have a better way of doing that. I want you to write this down. It's like you're playing Mad Libs. I don't know if you ever played that. It's the thing with the blanks and you fill them in. Here's what I want you to write. I'm gonna type it up so it's neat. In blank, uh, the phase changes from blank to blank. I hope the picture in picture is not covering that. I think it should work. The particles are changing from blank to blank. To do this, they must blank energy. Thus, this phase change is blank. So take a minute, write that down, pause if you need. I'm gonna start filling these in. What you wanna fill in is 
sorry, not what you want to fill in. What each of these blanks represents is the following. In blank, the first blank is whatever phase change you're looking at. The phase changes from blank to blank. So this is from like solid, liquid, or gas to solid, liquid, or gas. You know, like in, you would say in condensation, the phase changes from gas to liquid. The particles are changing from blank to blank. This is referring to their speed. I'm looking for slow, medium, or fast for both of these. Slow, medium, and fast, we can think of that as solid, liquid, and gas in that order. So in my example, I said there, in condensation, particles, uh, sorry, the phase changes from gas to liquid. The particles thus are changing from fast to medium. Right? To do this, they must blank energy. There's two words we can use, either absorb or release. Think about this. If you're a particle and you want to speed up, what do you need to do? You need to gain more energy because remember, speed is energy for movement. You give that particle more energy, it's going to zip off faster. If you want to slow that particle down, it needs to release energy. You need to dump off energy in order to slow down. So absorb or release. Let's do our condensation. Well, our last thing here. The last blank, thus, this phase change is blank. This is either going to be endothermic or exothermic. Okay, so with our condensation example, here's what we're going to say. In condensation, the phase changes from gas to liquid. The particles are changing from fast to medium. To do this, think about it, fast to medium, what do they have to do? To do this, they have to release energy. Thus, this phase change, condensation, is exothermic. If, you're, if the particles have to release energy to slow down, it's gonna be exothermic. So if you just remember this general story, and again, you don't have to memorize this, but if you kind of tell this type of story in your head, it's a way of getting around just memorizing which is uh, endothermic and which is exothermic. So uh, why don't we practice a couple of these? Uh, let's do um, melting. And let's do um, deposition. In fact, why don't you pause the video and tell this story for each of these and come up with an answer. Are these endothermic, exothermic, which is which? OK, let's go through melting. So the story we say is in melting. The phase is changing from what to what? Well, melting solid to liquid. So the particles are going from slow to medium. If you're going from slow to medium, they're speeding up, right? So what do they have to do? They have to absorb energy. Therefore, melting is endothermic. Deposition. In deposition, particles are traveling, uh, sorry, they're changing. This is one where it skips liquid. They're going from gas all the way down to solid. So the particles go from fast to slow, to do this, they must release energy to slow down. Therefore, deposition is exothermic. One more example uh, we can talk about with kind of a real life um, effect here is evaporation. So let's talk evaporation here. Evaporation is a phase change where you go from liquid to gas. To do this, the particles have to speed up. So they have to go from uh, uh, medium to fast. They have to absorb energy to do that. And therefore, evaporation is endothermic. It's absorbing heat. So let me ask you this. Why do humans sweat? What's the biological function of that? Well, it's to cool down, right? Well, well how does sweating cool us down? It's actually not the sweating that does it. It's when the sweat evaporates off your body that it carries some of your body heat away in order to cool down. We refer to this sometimes as evaporative cooling. And we see this in a lot of different things, uh, you know, mostly it's, it's just our human bodies. That's how you cool down. It's, it's the sweat evaporating off your skin. And that's why when it's like 100% humidity, what that means is there's so much moisture in the air 
that you actually, your sweat can't actually evaporate. It has to do with something called vapor pressure. There is so much vapor pressure in the air that it, it's holding as much water as it can. So therefore the sweat's not gonna leave your body. So the evaporative cooling of, of evaporation doesn't take effect. That's why sweating doesn't really cool you down when it's 100% humidity. That's why people get overheated all the time. That's why it's like so miserable and like swampy in places with high uh, humidity. So that's evaporation that explains um, why it's uh, endothermic and why that helps cool us down. Uh, okay, the last thing I'm going to cover in this video is something called phase diagrams. Phase diagrams. A phase diagram is a graph that plots pressure on one axis and temperature on the other, generally going to be P on the Y and T on the X. And a phase diagram is going to have a line that is usually going to start at the origin. And it's going to sort of rise up like this. It's usually curved. And then it hits a point where it splits. And one will go like that, and one will generally go like that. Now, they're all kind of different in the angle of those lines, but they're all the same in that this segment represents solid, this represents liquid, and this represents gas. So what is a phase diagram? It's a graph that shows us the state of matter or phase of matter that something's going to be in at various temperatures and pressures. And at this point, I want to drive this very important point home. The state of matter of something does not just depend on temperature like you may have thought. It also depends on pressure. How do I get a liquid to boil away into a gas? Well, the obvious answer is you heat it up. But you could also take that water and change the pressure to get it to boil away into a gas. Or how do I get a solid to melt? You could play around with the pressure as well. So something's phase is based on pressure and temperature. Now let's show a couple famous examples of substances and we'll look at their phase diagrams. What would you say is like the most popular substance we work with? Water. Let's look at the phase diagram of water, which I have right here. Now, I don't know how well that's coming through on your end. Hopefully you can see this, but on the y-axis, we have pressure. Now, please notice the scale, not to scale at all. We have one ATM of pressure, standard pressure right here, one ATM. We have 0 0.006 uh, here, and we have 218 here. So notice, it's not to scale. This is just done for our convenience. Same thing with temperature down here. It's a little better, but it's still way off. We have zero degrees Celsius here, 0 0.01 degrees Celsius here, 100 degrees Celsius here, and 374 degrees Celsius here. So it's not to scale. This is not designed to, to you know, be you know, measured to scale. It's just designed to help teach us this. So what's going on here? Well, let's start with what we know, which is one atmosphere of pressure. That's what you're experiencing right now. Um, you know, on a, if it's a nice sunny day when you're watching this, it might be a little higher than that, you know, maybe 1.02. Uh, if it's kind of a stormy, rainy day, it might be a little lower, like, uh, you know, 0 0.97. But it's not really going to be anything different than that. So we're pretty much at 1 ATM. Now, if you take H2O less than 0 degrees Celsius at 1 ATM, you're going to be solidly in the ice range. How do you get it to switch from ice to water? How do you get it to cross this line? Well, you cross that point, which is zero degrees. So this just tells you that when your temperature changes at, when your temperature crosses zero degrees at standard temperature, your H2O will transfer from ice into water. Now, how do you get that to turn into a gas if you're at standard pressure? Well. You increase temperature, increase temperature, increase temperature, increase temperature until you get to this point. What is this point? There's 100. So this is, sometimes we refer to the standard pressure as like the normal boiling point and the normal freezing point of water or melting point of ice. So this shows zero and 100 because that's where it's gonna change phases when the pressure is one ATM. But what can I do to actually change that? What if you increase the pressure? Let's say we have a regular glass of water. Like I have water in this uh, container here. It's pretty much room temperature and uh, we're pretty much at room pressure. 
So if I'm at room temperature, look, like I said, this isn't a scale, but let's just assume I'm right here, okay? Standard pressure. Now, let's imagine this is some kind of a uh, reverse vacuum chamber where I, I can actually compress this so using an air compressor. I can add particles to this and then seal it off somehow. So I have higher pressure in here. How would that affect this graph if I have higher pressure? Well, this line would tick up, up, up to maybe something up here. And again, the scale is kind of wacky, so I don't really know how high that is. But let's say I pressurize this by increasing something like n, number of particles, and now I have higher pressure. And then I start heating it. Now, it is a closed container, so it'd be a little unsafe, but theoretically, let's say I started heating this. Well, now I'm going to heat it here, heat it here, heat it, heat it, heat it, and here it's going to boil. But look what happened. We're well above 100 degrees now. So notice how you can boil something not at its boiling point. You can boil it above its boiling point. How do you do that? You have to pressurize it. You have to add pressure. And if you've ever used a pressure cooker, or if your parents have a pressure cooker, that's the whole idea is that you put water in there and usually some kind of like soup or broth or something like that, stew, and you seal it. And it always has this like very solid, like locking, you know, seal there. And then the machine pumps air into it to increase the pressure and then heats it up. And you end up with getting that temperature well above 100 degrees uh, to cook your food faster, maybe give it different flavors and things like that. And uh, if your parents ever work with a pressure cooker, you may have like heard the sound of them being done with it because they turn, they, they usually click down on a vent and you hear that they blast steam out into your kitchen because it's full of extra pressure and then it has to release it all at once. Now, what else can I do here? Well, what if I do the opposite? What if I hook this up to my vacuum chamber and decreased the pressure here? What if I started with here and I decreased the pressure and then I heated it up? Well, here it's going to boil. But notice we're now below our boiling point. So you can actually reduce the boiling point. If I sucked the air out of this or some of the air out of this, I can boil this water at like 70 degrees. I could boil it at room temperature. I could actually get it to boil at room temperature if I remove enough air from this. It's pretty strange, but there are some like real world applications here. If you've ever looked at food packaging, especially for things like when you're like baking things or like cooking something like pasta in water, sometimes they list high elevation instructions. Well, why do they need to do that? Well, there are certain parts of the world where the elevation is so high that there's a significant drop in, in normal atmospheric pressure. I mean, if you live in like Breckenridge, Colorado, or if you travel there on vacation, you notice that loss in pressure. In fact, I should say, if you live there, you probably don't notice it. You're acclimated to it. But if you travel there for a few days to ski, you notice that high elevation, lower pressure. So if you're at a lower pressure here, that's where your water is going to boil at like 90 degrees. So think about it. If your water is going to boil at maybe 95 degrees Celsius or 92 degrees Celsius instead of 100, like us here at sea level, are you going to have to cook your pasta for longer or for shorter? You're going to have to cook it for longer. You might think shorter because the water is going to start boiling faster. But what, and that's true. It will start boiling faster, all else equal. But you're going to have boiling like 90 degree water. Whereas here in Connecticut, we're going to have boiling 100 degree water. So you might actually have to cook your pasta for longer. So a lot of times the high elevation instructions tell you to cook your food for, you know, 14 minutes instead of 12 minutes, something like that. Okay, um, one last example I want to say while I'm here on phase diagrams, uh, bringing some of my geoscience into this. We looked at the earth when we talked about convection. These are the layers of the earth. We have the inner core here, which is solid. We have the outer core here, which is liquid. Inner core is solid. It's solid iron and nickel. Outer core is liquid, liquid iron and nickel. What layer of the earth is hottest? Well, the dead center of the earth is the hottest. There's the highest pressure there and there's the most radioactive decay. It's the hottest in the dead center of the earth. So why has the solid inner core not melted into liquid yet? Think about it. Doesn't it make sense that the hottest part would be the liquid, the molten, and the, the part outside of it that's a little cooler? Shouldn't that be the solid because it froze? 
Well, there's something else going on here. And that thing that's going on is pressure. And if you look at a phase diagram, you can see uh, that inside the earth, the pressure holds the inside of the earth into the solid form, even though it's way hotter than it should be to otherwise melt. If you could somehow take the core of the earth and instantly move it to the surface, it would very quickly melt, catastrophically, I'm sure. But the, the inner core is solid because of the intense pressure. So the main takeaway with the phase diagram I want you to understand is that something's phase doesn't just depend on temperature like you probably thought. It also depends on pressure as well. Last thing we're going to show is it only take about two minutes. Another very common substance is carbon dioxide. This is the phase diagram of carbon dioxide. I just want us to notice what's different about this compared to water. Where are we right now on this? Well, I'm standing in the classroom. You know, you're watching this maybe in your classroom, maybe at home. You're probably at one atmosphere. I'm at one atmosphere, which is here. What about the temperature? Well, 31's a little hot. That's like a summer day. We're probably right about here, which is why right now the carbon dioxide around you is in gaseous form. What happens if you cool this down? If you took a sample of CO2 gas, like if you went to the store and bought a tank of CO2 and you cooled it down and you cooled it down and you cooled it down and you cooled it down, boom, phase change. Well, what phase change is that? That's gas going directly into a solid. That's deposition. Notice we skipped the liquid phase. This is why dry ice sublimes, which is the verb of sublimation, Dry ice, which is down here, this is dry ice. It goes directly into a gas. It skips the liquid. And this is why gas, gaseous CO2, would deposit directly into a solid. CO2 does this because due to various reasons, which we don't need to get into in this video, the phase diagram for a liquid, uh, the liquid part of the phase diagram is at a higher pressure. Now, can you get liquid CO2? Yeah, just never at standard pressure. You need to, excuse me, increase your pressure to at least 5.1 atmospheres, which is you know, 5.1 times more pressure than you're feeling right now. If you get it to 5.1 atmospheres, you could end up in this region here, okay? So understand the difference uh, between CO2 and H2O. Um, you can also see a couple more vocab terms on this, the triple point is the point at which all three phases can exist. It's very interesting. I would recommend after this, or maybe even right now, just Google like triple point uh, of water, triple point of something, and look at some of the videos. And you can see that if you manipulate pressure and temperature in a way, you can actually see all three phases pretty much existing, changing very quickly into one another. It's really interesting to watch. I would do that, find a 30 second clip. And then there's something called the critical point above which, we have supercritical fluid. The critical point is the point where the temperature is so absurdly high, the particles are moving so absurdly fast, well beyond boiling point. Well, I shouldn't say that because it's on the line, but well above the normal boiling point. The temperature is so high that it wants to be a, a gas. It wants to boil into a gas. Well, why can't it? Because the pressure is so high that it's holding it down into a liquid. So you can think of it like this. The very high pressure makes it want to be a liquid. The very high gas makes it want to be a, sorry, the very high temperature makes it want to be a gas. So it, in, in some senses, it's kind of like a mix of the two. And in fact, in this one, we can see it nicely. See how the, we get this super critical fluid that's just kind of like a blend of the two. It ends up being this sort of like a new phase, not, not really though. It's kind of like a liquidy, vapory, uh, uh, gaseous type phase. And it's another cool thing if you want to open a new tab and just quickly look at some super critical fluid. And there are some real applications with this. I've, I've heard of super critical water being used to clean up like incredibly dangerous industrial spills, like things that normal water couldn't like absorb, super critical water can for some reason. So again, just a couple of vocab terms here on the phase diagram, um, triple point, critical point, supercritical, and just understanding the pressure and temperature both play a role. Okay, so a lot of information here. Uh, you can, of course, let me know later if you have any questions on this. Uh, and that's it for this one.